can I get my child into that school? And when they then have uh, sat their children through the horrific process of 11 plus or whatever process, and they've got four or five choices to, that they have been offered, they then don't know which one to choose. Um, so at either end of it, it's all pretty ghastly. And so the only sensible thing, because I don't really recognize myself as being a big thinker, the only really sensible thing I have come up with is saying, um, if you look inside a well-run girls' school, you find very happy children. If you look inside a well-run boys' school, you find happy children. If you look inside a well-run co-ed school, you see the punchline. Um, by the way, my school is co-ed. You needed to understand that to find that joke funny. And the lack of response from the audience suggests either you are brain dead and have got trouble with your children, um, or you've just fallen asleep, or the acoustics are really, really bad. Um, so, but there is a gentleman at the back with a red tie who's smiling. That is a good sign. Um, and what I suggest is that uh, the, the frustrating thing about running an independent school is that the other independent schools out there are all so damn good. Um, and the children are flexible and adaptable, and pretty much wherever you send them, they tend to flourish um, as long as the school is well run. But parents do not share that flexibility and adaptability. You are, quite frankly, rubbish. You have very fixed ideas about education, um, generally speaking, forged in your own either wonderful or traumatic experiences. However, looking across the audience, I can't actually see the scars of your own education on you. Um, so therefore, I think it doesn't matter as much as we make it seem. Um, I'm saying all this because I know that Patrick is determined to disagree with me at every point, and we've worked out this is an area of obvious disagreement. But the, um, my sense is when you go around and look at a school or when you walk to a stand, it's don't imagine the school when things are going well because nobody loves Highgate, stand 618 by the way, nobody loves Highgate um, as much as those who are finding it going well. But when it's going wrong and you are objecting to the way French is taught, I teach French, that's why you're allowed to object to it, or you don't like uh, the team that your child has got into, or whatever it is. Um, you need to be able to think that the school is hardwired to deal with the way you are as a parent, and the way you want to sort out problems, because it's difficult to imagine uh, 15, 11, or seven years in a school, five years in a school, without there being some difficulties. And so I think parental fit is something quite often not looked at uh, in this debate about how you can spot whether your ducklings are going to turn into swans. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, it's always a pleasure to follow Adam. Um, I've just flown in from Washington, not Washington, Tyne and Weir, but Washington, D.C., where I was speaking at a conference where, to be honest, much the same question was being discussed by educators, because it was an American conference, about the selection of schools. It was one of the key themes um, of the conference, and I might um, share some of that later. I wouldn't disagree with much of what Adam said, and there's a whole lot of truth in that most independent schools are very, very good. Um, and you know, parents come visiting armed with loads of questions, normally prompted from the Good Schools Guide and other august publications. And I always say to parents, the crucial thing is a little bit like buying a house. You, you just get the sixth sense and atmosphere whether you feel it's the right school. Where I would disagree with Adam um, is you really do need to ensure that there is a best fit for your son or daughter. There is nothing worse in, as your children enter the long dark tunnel of adolescence, um, which as parents we all forget what we were like as teenagers. Um, and it's one of the things that causes us heads um, much anguish. But the crucial thing is you do not want your son or daughter to be in a school where they are going to struggle and where their self-confidence and self-esteem are going to plummet. Um, and I really, really do believe that passionately. And I've worked, been head of three very different schools, um, and I have seen evidence to support that in all three schools. So yes, it's cr all, most independent schools are very, very good. You should be able to work out the good ones, and there are lots of very good ones here. But for me, the crucial thing, and the hardest thing for all of us as parents, is to get the right fit for your child. So it's really understanding the idiosyncrasies, the peculiarities, and what makes the school distinctive. And in Westminster's case, that's really very straightforward. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna have as much time as possible for your questions. Uh, I'd ask you to uh, keep them short, and if you've got personal questions about your own children, come up and ask them afterwards, or come along to the Good Schools Guide stand. Uh, so keep the questions broad and the sort of ones that the rest of you will all want to hear the answers to. Uh, knowing 
whether your child can get into a particular school is, in our experience, an immense source of parental anxiety. Uh, I, I can remember from the time my daughter was going through this process, uh, some of her uh, some of her friends were being aimed too high, and they were spending every evening with tutors and every weekend with tutors for a school that they never really had a hope of getting into. And when eventually they ended up in the school that they always should have been aiming at, everybody was disappointed. Uh, and that's a sadness. So not, not knowing that a particular school, particularly these, particularly these two schools, are aiming high and if that's not where your child is, is born and, and set at, actually they're going to be a lot happier somewhere else. But how do you know that as parents? How do you know exactly what these schools are asking? How do you know whether your own child is set for that? That's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, and I would love to hear from those of you who've had experience who, or who face this question and, and want to put these two on the spot. So who would like to ask the first question? Nelson that. Testing. Um, a direct question for you two. Um, it's very well that you said that parents need to assess the suitability um, of their children for certain schools. And, um, Mr. Durham said that it's very much like buying a house. Okay, how about this? What criteria are you looking for students for your schools, respectively? Well, well Westminster is highly selective and the admission is done strictly on academic criteria. And it's critical that the boys that we admit in year nine and the girls who join us in the sixth form are able to cope with what is a very distinctive style of liberal teaching um, and not every child is going to be suited to that and I think as a parent it's critical that you you think through um, the type of education that's being offered I mean ours is it, it, it's taught in a very specific way um, and challenging and stretching beyond the curriculum um, we're not constrained by the syllabus. It's an incredibly liberating school to work in as a teacher and as a head, and we only worry about the exams when we need to. So in a sense, we're, that, that critical thing that we want from all schools is to prepare our young people for a lifelong journey of learning. But at Westminster, we take it to the, to the, to the, to the very top. And there's nothing wrong with educating the cleverest in an elitist way. I mean, it's what the country and what society and what the world needs. So unashamedly, I'd say that. But if I was answering the question as headmaster of rugby or headmaster of Solihull, I'd give you a very different answer. But that's not to say Westminster's better, it's just different. I'm, I'm very conscious that I'm talking as a London head and there is a, um, a particular situation if you're running a school in London, which is, first of all, there are quite a lot of schools and also a lot of children. Um, so we have about 650 children sitting at 11 plus, but they're all looking at more than one school. So I'm, I hope there are no shareholders to Ryanair, because I always take the Ryanair approach to this, but we, we offer more places than we have, um, but we hope for a soft landing um, and not to have to lay on extra jets. So there is a, it's a really quite difficult to know um, uh, what is going on when you're making your offers. So we rather like Patrick, and I think rather like every other North London school that I know, is we do use um, academic criteria uh, to select the children to whom we offer. Now, we, we take children at 3, 7, 11, a small number at 13, and then at 16, so the, the process is slightly different because when you're assessing children who are aged two and a half, you use a different set of criteria, and you're talking about effectively, are they ready for an accelerated curriculum starting age three, or would they be better off waiting for a bit longer before they started that curriculum? But I think the um, essence to us is that uh, when we've made those offers, we desperately hope that the parents and the children who have come have really looked into the school to see what it is we're seeking to do. Now, we are a slightly broader church than Westminster. We have to be, um, not least because we're taking children at different ages and we don't um, 
as it were, have a January window and a transfer window and say the children in year six who are not as bright as the ones who could be coming into year seven will clear them out and get another lot because we're not trying to win the premiership. Uh, we're trying to provide, and I'm not suggesting that Westminster is trying to do that, but what we are trying to do is to make sure that every child we've got in the system, which could be for 15 years, is getting an interesting liberal education, which means that they still like learning. They all love learning when they're 10, um, and it can be beaten out of them um, if you treat them the wrong way. And I would just say one thing about this long, dark tunnel of adolescence. Um, while I wouldn't want at any point to underestimate the difficulties of uh, mental health problems that uh, exist in the population generally, um, or indeed questions of identity, but I think adolescence is not nearly as bad as schools make it out to seem, and I bet that most of the adolescents actually going through Westminster or indeed any other school are having a fantastic time. Um, it is horrible for parents, however. Um, uh, but they, I can assure you, having children who are adolescents, that they are foul at home, with all due respect to Millie and Louis, but at school they are wonderful. And I, it's one of the great privileges of running a school in which my children are, as I can see both. That's sort of what I was saying. Not quite. <laughs> it's what I, it's, the audience understood me. The, problem are, the problems come when they're nasty at school and at home, but that's not for this session. Hi. Are your students are tutors at home? Because I know that some to stop on the top uh, league at school um, takes, take extra tutoring, not to cope with the program, but to get to the top of the year. Do you mean children who are having tuition once they've arrived at the school? Uh, yes, they already are in the school. Um, uh, the tu uh, tuition is not just to cope with the program, but to get to the top level. So if they would not be tutored, maybe they would be average level but they take that extra tutoring to go up, so it's... We're, we're, the, the question, in case you didn't hear it, is are you, con are you conscious of and what would you do about children who are being tutored when they are in your school as a, an indication to an extent of the, 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 the frenzy or the madness because uh, they want to be near the top of their year group. Um, obviously, if everybody tries to be near the top of their year group, then that way madness ensues. Now, there are a proportion of parents in any school who are bonkers. Um, and um, understanding what the parents are like and what they want and why they're manifesting this um, is quite important. So we do, on the basis when we come across somebody who is, in this terms, a bit frenetic, we do talk to them. But we are conscious that if there's been a very intensive 11-plus um, preparation uh, that's gone on, that quite a lot of time that parents have got into a mode of managing their children, which is when they come home from school, will not have a babysitter, but will have somebody who helps them with tutoring. They've got into a good relationship with that person, and then that person carries on, and they're supervising their homework. And we do have to challenge that and say, well, actually, even if they are there and looking after them, and that's worked for you, that actually then not to cut them free and let them make their own experiments with homework is really bad, because you want them to be able to cope well. And we're, we've actually now stopped... Uh, grading children in the same way in order to give parents a much greater sense of a progress from um, dependent learning through to independent scholarship and to explain to the parents that we're not assessing them on the basis of how well they do in tests, although we do do tests, um, but on the basis of what progress are they making towards that kind of independence, which then helps the culture of relaxing. Um, and I'd, while I, I do think it's a bit odd to have tutors in, um, I understand the anxiety and therefore we need to unpick the anxiety to give people to have confidence um, beyond the obvious thing saying it's absurd to try and be top of the, do top of the um, scales all of the time and really to encourage people to say, you know, how important is um, getting 100% at the moment in my French vocabulary tests compared to the other things I'm doing um, and begin to relax into that. And that takes a bit of time and takes confidence, um, but definitely we, we challenge it and we do ask parents to tell us um, anonymously, whether they're using any tutoring and why. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, there, there's an apocryphal story about a London school where a third of year seven pupils are having to have a tutor just to keep up with the schoolwork. They were so over tutored to get into the school, which is absurd. And that sums that basically explains the problem of tutoring. All of us as parents want to do, try and do the right thing for our children, but intensive tutoring is not the right thing, because ultimately the tutor cannot go into the classroom and do the work for the children, and they'll be very, very quickly exposed. And I spend my whole time trying to explain to people and have the confidence uh, not to do it. And I understand what it's like. I have lots of friends who are very sensible people until they start talking about schools in London, where they go a little bit doolally, and they just sort of get carried away um, on this. But, uh, for me, the most important thing is to allow your children to be their own person and to find their own level. Um, and for me, that's critical. But it was, we work very hard with 
the bonkers parents, as Adam quite rightly described them, which is a blessed minority, uh, but just trying to educate parents to take their, get off the treadmill and just relax and allow the children to enjoy their childhood and to get involved in all the rich extracurricular, co-curricular activities that all our schools offer. Um, and actually, you know, it, it, for me, they will learn as much about themselves in things they get involved with outside of the classroom than they will inside the classroom. But you want to allow them the chance to develop and breathe and do all those sorts of things that will make them confident young men and women at the age of 18. But, but neither of you are schools, are you, that chuck kids out at 16 if they're not keeping up with the pace. Uh, there certainly are some schools that, uh, where you have to keep the foot on the pedal all the way through. We have, well, we have an academic hurdle they have to get through, so it's not inconceivable that somebody could leave. But it would be a disappointing reflection on our admissions. I, th I, th I mean, I agree with Patrick, because we've got children who sometimes started with three, that are both sides, you know, what is there on offer at 18? First of all, it's, the school has developed in that time, and they may decide to do something different. But about a third of our year 11s will look elsewhere, while most of them will stay, because I think most parents regard the process of actually choosing what it is you're going to have rather than the default mechanism, I'll just stay, as being a good thing to do, because they're making quite a big investment for those final two years. Um, but no, we, don't, we, we, we have a suggested hurdle, but we'll pretty much stick with anybody we've got that far with um, in the belief that you know, they've got a lot of support mechanisms around them. Uh, I have a question over here. All right. Yeah. Basically, I mean, it's trying to find the right fit for your child. I mean, the question is related to that. We have been hearing a quite a lot that the school should fit your child and you should not go through a process or to a school where it would be a dark, long tunnel. The question is, how do you assess what is, I mean, first, how do you assess what is your child's interest? Because the children are quite evolving in a sense that their interest, their passion, their liking changes quite a lot. I have seen it with my child when she was three year old, when she was, I mean, obviously when she grew up to seven year and now she's nine, I've seen her interest developing. And I find it difficult still to understand what fit, which school would fit her the best, what, where, which area she would excel the most. And how should we go about it? I, th I, th I think as a, uh, a school that takes um, significant numbers, I mean, the, the greatest number of pupils at 11, um, and girls and boys, um, and in the London context, those girls and boys are sitting s lots and lots of schools because the families don't want to set themselves up for disappointment, so they wait until they've got the offers before they're making a choice, by which time the children are something like five or six months away from starting at that school. When the, the, the interests of the child are beginning to manifest themselves, but you've also got the ability to make judgment calls on the basis of, of, of the information that she's receiving and how she feels in the school. So I think that that um, instinctive, visceral response from a child um, is actually quite an important one. Um, and I think allied to, because if the school has made an offer, then the school is confident about the child being able to cope. So you can put that to one side. If you're talking about, do I enter my daughter for exams in schools um, which, is a, which is another series. Um, it depends what setting you're in. If your child is in an independent prep school, then obviously they're in a position to tell you what they think. Whereas if you're in a primary school, they're much, much less likely to give that. And I think then it's a matter of speaking to the school's admissions department and say, well, tell us um, what kind of results you would expect, uh, what, how they should be doing at school. Um, so you're just trying to gauge the academic level. And I think sitting more than five or six schools makes it very heavy January or December, January for that child. So there is a sense in which within that choice of six, unless you're getting very clear indications from your school that should only aim at the top, you should build in some different choices. So you've got very different schools there. So six schools that all take the same pupils, um, that, that doesn't give you any cushion for soft landing. So take those into account and then see what your daughter and you feel going round and Ask the, parent, ask the school, if there are no parents you already know, can you speak to somebody, a parent, who has got children not unlike mine, or can I meet them? And we do arrange events like that um, so that this can happen. Now, of course, if you take this to ad absurdum, we can't do it for everybody, but if there is a real sticking point and you're saying, I'm having trouble, then we would try to help out in that way. I'd agree with all of that. I mean, our main entry is at 13 plus, and the majority come from prep schools, and the prep school, by definition, preparatory schools preparing them for senior school would be able to help with the assessment of the suitability of school and I would we would put a great deal of trust in what the prep school head would say to us.
Does that mean you would uh, take a prep school's head opinion ahead of an exam result? We would, send, we would, anybody on the margin, we would look at the report very carefully. So when we're looking at the bottom five to 10%. And if a parent disagrees with the head, where do they turn for a second opinion? I think it'd be a pretty poor show if the prep school had fallen out with the parent. Hello, uh, thank you. It's just a quick question for Mr. Durham. Um, could you elaborate on what you meant by um, your school having an elitist teaching structure? Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about it, it, it's a school which in, in many ways is the home of liberal education. Um, and what we mean by that is the encouraging, I mean, every school will say they're teaching independent thinkers. Um, and I mean, I think any of us involved in education would sign up for that. But at Westminster, we really do do that. And we work very, very hard at stretching and extending them by the way in which we teach, by risk-taking of the teachers, by ignoring, as I said, the curriculum and the constraint of syllabus, by the way in which we do a lot of co-curricular work. So for example, year nine, we take them off timetable for a whole week where all the departments work together. They all do some drama. They do cross-curricular involving all the departments in writing extended essays from a very early age. So we're encouraging that ability to write extended pieces of work in areas of interest. We have an, a, a, an extraordinary range of options and cultural perspectives. Um, so courses, again, for the children to sign up to lower school activities. It's all designed to enrich and extend and to take them beyond the syllabus. And for me, the most exciting thing, and this is, in a sense, what we were talking about in America, is the sort of the most gifted teaching are those where it's a sort of Socratic method, where the teacher is, in a sense, trying to be a guide and not being the, the main focus and, and the best teaching that I have seen over the last one year, nine weeks and six days that I've been at Westminster, not that I'm counting, um, has been where the teacher has, with some very skillful questioning, has really extended the children to new levels. And that, for me, is the critical thing. Now, every school will try and do that, but Westminster, with this great Lockean tradition, this tradition of loyal descent, which goes right the way back to its founding, um, is, is make, makes it very, very distinctive. But it suits, at our level, you know, the very bright, sparky boy up to 16 who needs to be able to cope with that. Um, and, and in a sense, that comes back to that. So that's, that's in a sense, it's a sort of slightly rambling, but it's, but it's, a, it's a sort of a, a distinctive ethos that permeates everything that we do. And f you know, for me, it's, I've been taken out of my comfort zone after 30 years of teaching, because I still teach an A-level set, which is very unusual for a head. And I've got a set who question and challenge uh, every level, and that's fantastic. I'm very excited. I don't, I don't want to get, let Patrick get away with saying, just talking about Westminster. Um, but I think Please tell us about Highgate. I don't want to talk about Highgate in particular, but I think that what is fun over, over the last two or three years um, in English schools is this sense that there is f finally a pendulum swing against um, examinations and the achievement within, within examinations as being the sine qua non of uh, teacher training. And I think there is beginning to be a sense that what you should be saying to people is choose the examination system, the examination board, on the basis of the least distorting effect it will have on the way you wish to teach and what you wish to teach. Now, that may play itself out differently within a very, very selective school or a less selective school, but it's still really important because assessment is not meant to be um, the way in which you teach. People who set exams don't expect us to interpret in that way. They are setting exams so that they are just and fair and help the UK PLC remain literate and numerate. Nobody ever thought that was going to be the way we would then teach. But then you apply the wrong pressure and analyse the results in the wrong way, um, and that's what then happens. Um, you said at the start that if, they, if, if you had to respond on the questions of admissions for your previous schools, it would have been very different. On your experience, both of you, if you had to create like a big brush profiling of schools in the independent um, environment, there's the highly academic, very selective, what would be the other profiles? Well, I mean, the reason why I said what I said, because I've come from a full boarding school, and so that's a very, very different um, admissions criteria in a sense, because you're looking for, it was a fully co-ed school, looking for boys and girls who could cope with full boarding um, and seven days a week. 
and that's slightly different. And, that, and it's a sort of, sort of different sort of parent as well. And of course, it's an extended week and lots going on. So in a sense, there's a, there's a whole swathe of boarding schools. And, but then the boarding schools cover a multitude from the very academic all the way down. But the common factor would be boarding. Having said that, of course, one of the things that is misunderstood about Westminster is that Westminster is a quarter boarding. So to have a boarding school in the centre of London is extraordinary. And of course, what makes Westminster distinctive, apart from its teaching, to give it another plug, is that we have an extended day and an extended week. Um, we have Saturday school, um, which obviously is very unusual in London. Um, and we run the day where the day pupils can be in the school from breakfast up until nine o'clock at night working in the library. So that's a, a very sort of distinctive feel to it. But then you've got schools which would, you know, and, and a lot of the schools out here who I know very well would emphasize the development of character um, and, and that all round development. Um, and with, you know, obviously still trying to get the best possible exam results for their pupils, but will be looking at the all-round development in the broadest holistic sense. Um, in order to try and say something different, um, because if we carry on agreeing like this, it's going to get even duller than it already is for you. Um, I think that two things. One is I think that independent education is changing hugely. Um, I get a sense that with the movement of private equity into school ownership, you're getting a very different approach. And the fact that there are some parts of the country where you do not have enough schools to meet the demands and other parts of the country where there are not enough pupils in a position or whose parents are not in a position to meet the fees, and so you have schools that are becoming free schools, I think it is difficult now to characterize or use the old labels. And so I think if you're geographically attached to an area, then you need to sort of almost tear up the rule book. Um, or tear up an old rule book and be using school guides and local um, uh, knowledge and also visiting to say, well, if this weren't an HMC school or whatever sc branded school, would I still be happy? Or is, when you go through the doors of an HMC school, um, so a headmasters and headmistresses conference school, do you feel that it actually lives up to your expectations? Um, because within uh, HMC, which has got 270 schools, um, 15 of which are all girls' schools which are just joined, I mean, that's already um, a, a significant difference. And then secondly, how are the schools run or governed? Are they charitable institutions with a strong um, move towards uh, meeting their public benefit willingly, or are they effectively commercial enterprises which are very customer orientated and willing to move with the times so if they find people are all coming in and wanting to do something different, they'll start to do things differently. So I, I would encourage a bit more open-mindedness, and while I, under, I don't mean that anybody here is closed, but the shorthands that we have used in the past, I don't think are going to continue to work over the next 10 years. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I guess my question is, um, in your experience, are there any particular profile of boys that are particularly suited to boys' school um, or particularly suited to co-educational co school, depending on you know, the interests, the characteristics, the, um, the, the personality? Do you see a trend or a pattern in your experience? No. Yes. <laughs> Could you elaborate further on that, please? No. I, ju I just said yes because it seemed better to be contrary. Um, I go back, um, as the patient teacher I am, to make the point I started off and saying, I think it comes back to the way that the, p the boy in particular has been parented. Um, and I don't mean whether he's got brothers or whatever. It's what does the parents, and clearly if there's more than one parent involved in bringing up the child, then there may not be the same point of view. I have the, the fascinating discussions always with parents who disagree about which school to choose. But there are, if you believe that boys learn better only with boys, and you have socialized your son only to spend time with boys, and every time something goes wrong in the senior school, you ascribe it to the fact that there are girls present, then your son probably isn't going to thrive. But I and it's difficult to run experiments. And as people have got twins, they're willing to, you know, to use as a kind of sort of um, experiments to say one child goes to one school and one child goes to the other and we'll see what happens. So it's quite difficult to prove. But I find that I have um, every conceivable combination of families where the boy is with us and the daughter is in a girl's school um, or, and or the, the, the girl is with us and the boy is in a, in, a, in a boy's school and everything else, sometimes because the child has made their own decision and sometimes because the parents um, can't make up their minds about what system is right and we don't have a siblings policy which allows every child to come to the school anyway. So I don't really agree that um, there are separate profiles of boys if parented in certain ways, but I do believe that the way that parents 
end up creating the vision for their child may mean that they produce a child who's looking for something which is offered more in a boys' school than a co-ed school. Um, but it doesn't go much deeper than that. And I don't think it's so wise to be staring at your child over the breakfast table saying, it's just said that, therefore it's a boys' school. Um, I think it's, you've got to look at yourself and think what you think is right. I think you certainly can find some, some instances where a girl clearly has an ease in making friends with boys or a real difficulty in making friends with boys, and the same, the same for boys with girls. And then that does point in a particular direction, but most kids are really adaptable. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that co-education doesn't mean that all girls spend all their times in co-ed contexts. Very frequently the case in co-ed schools where, as in the workforce, girls spend quite a lot of time because they choose to socially together and boys. It changes obviously through adolescence. It's critical, however, that the school makes sure that the learning environment is one in which each child is willing to sit next to anybody, regardless of their gender. And then obviously you're introducing by that, regardless of anything, because we mustn't make our, we, we we're preparing them for the workplace where they don't say, I'm not going to work with somebody because. Um, so I think that's actually quite an important thing. Yeah, and I'd just say, I, I, having worked in every type of school, um, I'm fed up with heads who will sit and say that co-ed is better than single sex or vice versa. It's absolute nonsense. Um, there are great schools, great co-ed schools, great single sex schools. There's some pretty rubbish ones as well. And it comes back to the whole purpose of what we're sitting here on a Sunday afternoon, lunchtime discussing, is choosing the right school for your children. Um, so... A lot of the top schools talk not just about um, exam results, but a quality of curiosity or sparkiness because it's assumed that anybody who's successful will be very academically gifted. How can parents be realistic about whether their kid has this quality of sparky brilliance over and above uh, academic testing? And if they don't have it, can the right school give it to them or does that make their child unsuitable for a top school and they should go somewhere for very clever people who lack inspiration or whatever quality it might be? If I've understood it correctly, I mean, when, when they've gone through the first hurdle, which is the um, academic selection, they then get an interview, yeah. and you, within a nanosecond, you can tell whether a boy at that stage has got a real spark. It's very simple, if I'm honest. So if you get an interview, and no matter how well coached they are, you can soon unpick the coaching and the tutoring um, and the great thing about 10, 11, 12-year-olds is they're disarmingly honest um, and will tell you exactly what they're feeling. Um, and, they, and they haven't all read Dickens from start to finish. Um, or if they say they have, they can be exposed pretty quickly. But in a nice, humane way, I hasten to add. Unlike at some London schools. <laughs> I don't know how to take that, but I'm think, I can't imagine... Was it, I wasn't thinking of North London schools. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 um, I think the, the ability to be sparky and be curious um, is only really possible if you're in an environment where you feel that you're thriving and you're comfortable. Um, so I think that the question about the... Well, it sounds a bit blunt to say you've got to pass tests first. Once children are in a zone where the school is confident that they will cope, then I think the preconditions, subject to parental fit, are there that most children can be, will be curious um, as long as they're not met with uh, a, 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 you know, a forced march through to GCSEs where they think that the only thing is, is important is GCSEs. And I have asked my staff, I've instructed my, I mean, I'm not a great one for giving instructions to my staff, but saying you will not talk about years 10 and 11 when the children are 15, 16 as being the GCSE years. I mean, they are not. Um, they are, there are incidental exams that take place. So I think that once you've got the preconditions right, children will manifest curiosity in very different ways. But I think that all good schools will then be able to find something that children are curious about. And the idea that you could be in a non-selective school or a comprehensive school, not be uh, academically minded, or not have those neurons yet connected which allow you to tackle um, the top end of something without being curious is wrong. Children are inherently curious, and it's only when it's beaten out of them by the wrong experience, um, by finding everything difficult before uh, the time when they're intellectually able to deal with it. I mean, if we were to delay the teaching of maths to the Norwegian system or to the Australians and not introduce the times tables until later on, actually we'd probably find fewer people in this country with hang-ups over maths. But we can't rewrite that. So I think it is important to say that you know, good families and good schools in the right place will always have to cure as children. So, in effect, should a parent assume that their child is sparky and curious until proven otherwise? Unless they are bashing it out of them, yes. All children have a spark and an interest in something. Okay. That's the great thing about children. It's just finding it. 
And, and, and when you go around a school, look for kids like yours. Uh, and, or ask, about, ask other children about how does a kid like yours do in the school. It can be quite extraordinary where people who are slow to start with sparkiness can flourish and be appreciated. I remember a really sort of medium level sporting school in, out in the west of London where the people who were actually quiet and academic were really valued by everybody else because they could help them with their sums. Uh, and uh, and it, they fitted into the structure of the school and the school brought them out of themselves a bit. So just look at an individual school and see what, what children like that who are slow at developing sparkiness how they enjoy the school, how they're appreciated. Could, could I just I'm jump in? I'm going to cut across you, please, because we're going to have to keep to our timetable. So one more question, Rafe, if that's OK. Yeah, I'll have the microphone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I need the help from um, two experts at the moment. Um, I have very young um, little boys, uh, two, two of them. I try to introduce the joy of learning uh, and when they do something to be more focused um, and also self-learning, I, I, I try to introduce them this, like the, the where I'm from, you know, we work hard, but my learning journey is not so much about enjoying. Um, it's about you have to do it. But I think I try to do a different thing with the next generation. Um, but I feel it's difficult because they rather to watch cartoon instead of doing like homework. Um, yeah, how? I, th I believe everybody has a potential. How we encourage them? And uh, uh, well, I've, uh, it's a very good question. And um, I, there was I had a parents forum where they were a sort of a couple of times a year they can come in with tomatoes and throw them at me, which is you know why I'm not wearing that particular suit today. But where a particular parent was talking about you know. Um, really attacking the school for um, the way in which we were producing uh, a, a sense that there were children at the top, children at the bottom, and so on and so forth. And the more she spoke, the more it became clear um, that this was a problem of her own vision, that she was disappointed with the information she was getting back from the school, even though we were not disappointed ourselves. We thought it was utterly fine and normal, and we were proud and pleased of her daughter. And she became, she became aware that this was a sort of cultural construct. And we all have cultural constructs, which is why I said parental fit is so important. Now, my head of Mandarin comes from mainland China, um, wonderfully adapted to Britain and what have you. But she has, we were asking her why it was that her results in Mandarin were so much better than the results in French, the subject I teach. And she said, well, first of all, I'm a better teacher than you, um, which was a you know, good point to make. But she also says um, that I don't confuse uh, the sense of wanting to get things right um, and care about getting things right with having fun. So she has challenge Friday period six last lessons where James Bond theme music is being played while they're trying to get some of their characters right. And so there's a real sense of fun there, but it's not in any sense of being dumbed down. And I think that um, when the task is right for the child, wanting to get it right, wanting to be competitive is actually quite a healthy thing as long as not everything rides on it. It's only about Friday period six. What happened on Friday period six doesn't have any implication on the way you view the child on Monday or then any time thereafter. And I think it's a little bit about learning in that context. And I'm going to stop there because I realize Patrick's got something much more significant to say. I have, which actually is very, very interesting because um, why I was in Washington, it was for schools across the world that had taken the OECD PISA-based test for schools. Um, and so it was educators from across the world. And what's really interesting, because preparing people for the 21st century, PISA and the OECD are redoing the test for the next wave, both for countries and for schools that take it, to actually drill down to, for the love of learning and to try and measure that. So in a sense, it was particularly interesting for those from Southeast Asia. Um, and we had a very good presentation from the Japanese delegation who were bemoaning um, the sort of system that they had gone through and actually they had scored really badly on this very sophisticated tables. So I think there is change across the world and I would agree with everything that Adam said uh, and, and it comes back to just allowing your children to, to find their level and, and not to try and live your life through your children. And it's really hard. It's really, really hard. But is there an actually um, an element of UTOP schools uh, looking to assess how the parents bring up the children? 
so are we, are we, are we going to assess the parents? No, we can't. We, well, we can't. We, can't. That would, we, just, we just hope that very That would be a step too far. Yeah, we haven't got the time. Uh, and what I mean is... is I think it I'd ask like the next head up on the stage that question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. well, I, well, Master is, Highgate suggested in w- the last session parents need to be assessed. He did say parents were bonkers earlier. And you agreed, <laughs> because you always follow Highgate. And I just say, stand 618. Okay. Time's up. Sorry. I'm not trying to catch you up. Thank you both.